sure enough, I sort of realised that the the release came on the field where you could wear your heart on your sleeve, you know, and you could give everything, and and that was sort of accepted. But off the field, it was a lot riskier, you know, in terms of emotional exposure, and you sort of end up closing off and thinking that this this isn't the place for that, and maybe this won't work, and I've got to be like that, so I'm gonna close and conform and, and shape myself into into this and then as I got older I realised that the whole person is what you wanted and someone who can't um, just rely on his talent and I'm having to rely on acceptance and um, self-kindness um, and caring for you know the, the position I'm in and step through some more fear and, and realise that actually, do you know what, I, I, I love speaking, I've, I've, I've been a keynote speaker since I was 22, funny enough, um, but realise that this is this is me, this is what, what I want to do, and there's the pressure to perform, there's the creativity in there, there's the off the cuff stuff, there's the action and, and there's the reliance on me to, to pull something out of the bag, which is, is like playing rugby. Hi, my name's Andrew Payne, and welcome to Men on Show, and I'm delighted to welcome Stevie Ward to Men on Show. Stevie, a former professional rugby player and part of the golden generation at the Leeds Rhinos, one of the most successful teams in Super League history. Steve became the youngest captain, is that right? Young, no, grand, youngest grand final winner ever, a name captain at just 26. But also you, you've faced adversity, uh, some uh, life-changing injuries, and I want to get into that. And obviously now you're promoting uh, mental health for men through your counselling, uh, life coaching services, and a stigma-breaking uh, podcast that you, you, you've been running. So it's an absolute privilege, uh, Stevie, to have you on the show. Thank you, mate. Awesome to be here. Cool. So just um, just to start us, growing up, uh, Stevie, what kind of stands out to you as a kid? What's your kind of most vivid memories, sort of good or bad? What stands out to me, mate, was um, many times turning up to a rugby rugby field and catching a ball and feeling this fear and trepidation gravitating towards, you know, the defensive line in front of me, which on a rugby field is uh, a load of guys. You know, when I was young, obviously, young boys were in my mind, they were big angry men that wanted to grab me from it to ground and smash me, you know. Um, but I remember, like, the feeling that I used to get catching a ball and moving towards the line. And it was, well, I mean, it was, there was fear in it, but there was also this like anticipation and excitement moving towards it. And naturally, it was so natural. Um, but coming into touch and distance of that line, I'd sort of veer towards the right. Um, and I'd almost like side on. And I remember shaping my body up to the skies. And I remember just at the perfect moment, stamping my right foot down. Uh, and putting into this defensive line, mate, and you, you know, there's that moment of truth where you feel this like bracing for contact, and you're sort of like hoping that you get through to the other side of it, and you feel these arms trailing at your waist, these fingernails scragging at your neck, you know, to bring you back to the other side of the line. And I remember popping through, um, and hearing my mum, you know, I can remember that. I hear my mum from the touchline screaming my name, come on, stay there. And, you know, it's just like, I just had that feeling of freedom and exploration and adventure and, like, I could do anything, you know. Yeah. And then moving towards the fullback, who, who was the last line of defence between me and the try line, I'd just be full of it. I'd have this swagger and I'd act on a daydream that I'd had four days before in maths class and I'd drop the ball onto my foot, I'd knock it over the top of his head and I'd run around side, I'd catch it, and then it'd just be sprint a sprint home. That's what I like to call it, a sprint to the try line. Yeah. You know, and, and getting there, swan dive over it, over the line and, and landing on your front with the ball as your landing gear, mate. I did just have this feeling that everything was just right. And that was a lot of my life, you know. Yeah, amazing. And you feel, sort of looking back, that there was something kind of naturally in you. Or do you have yeah. rug do you have rugby in your family at all? Or no, not so much, mate. No, my mum and dad were uh, met on a bike rally, motorbike rally. Um, okay. They called me Stevie Ray Vaughan after famous blues guitarist and singer. 
um, which I'm I've got more similar hair to him now. You know, yeah, soon he... I finish rugby, I can grow my hair and look <laughs> like a, a blues guitarist. Um, but yeah, it, it wasn't really in the family. I just saw my uh, like my child mind as I remember the next door neighbor was playing around with rugby ball and 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 that was it. You know, and just just immediately had this this searching like all in feeling about me all in drive about me um and at the same time i think there was a layer of real uh caring and sensitivity and and um vigilance as well you know interesting and you feel that you had that for rugby would you set that kind of drive, you know, and I'm imagining it now because I used to, I was terrible at rugby. Uh, I mean, I absolutely hated rugby as a kid. I was all right at football, but the thought of, you know, running out there, I, I was a bit of a scraggy runt when I was sort of a teenager. I was always flattened. I was always put on the wing and flattened. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I actually remember one game, my team were furious because I had the ball. I was running. I could see I was about to be flattened. So I stopped running and gave the team the ball and said, you know what? Just take it away, whatever. <laughs> um, so, like, I I didn't have... I mean, I had drive in other areas of my life. Um, yeah. Did, do you feel like what you're describing, running at that defensive line, that anticipation, you're describing vigilance, like the feeling alive, the determination when people got their mm. hands around your waist, the, the excitement of the game. Did, did you have that kind of excitement, those kind of personality traits for other bits of your life? Or was it just on that rugby field that it sort of all came yeah. together? That's a really good question. I think, um, I think, yeah, I think listening to music, I, you know, I enjoyed English literature when I was younger, um, especially if it was a book I was interested in. And I'd be like, you know, I'm in a field there looking at what it meant, what these things meant. Um, and, you know, just like I made a contract with myself when I was younger to not miss a tackle and, and not feel like I'd let myself down. I think, somehow was leaked into life as well and um trying not to leave a stone unturned really uh i guess social life when i was younger it was just you know things were a conquest and things were to to achieve and and things were um yeah the, a high achiever you know i just i just couldn't i just couldn't let things go and i had to, i had to be the one that was doing the thing whatever that was and when did you start playing rugby like i imagine sort of you you at school you, you've got talent presumably that talent gets spotted at some level that actually this kid he, not only is he, he playing rugby he's actually pretty good like mm -hmm. how do we sort of step him up into a uh, uh an area where he, he's really up against even better kids where when was that real talent spotted and it was begun you began to feel elevated looking back I feel like it was pretty much straight away like under eights under nines and it was just sort of a matter of time in my mind that I would be part of some you know elevated camp whether that's national camp whether that's playing for the Leeds area whether that's getting onto the scholarship at 12 years old it was back then um, you know and, and, and it was it was sort of coming away from your comfort zone of all these people you know your mum and dad are integrated into the community community and um, being the leader to to go into these other groups of young men that you you're not sure of and you don't know who they are and um, that took some adapting um, in order for my true self and um, you know that that sort of winner and achiever and and driver to come through you know and so that was that was quite young um, and a lot of rugby was played a lot of training sessions were were played. A lot of times I didn't didn't want to, um, but yeah, man, it was it was it was quite a ride when I was young. And do you, thinking back to when you were a kid, when you were a teenager, uh, as as a as a young man growing into the sport, was there much care and attention back then as to your physical well being, emotional well being, mental well being? Did, did the coaches that you experienced have a good grasp? of that from what you can recall i'd say one well, it, it wasn't really a thing you know i think it was um it was yeah literally just relying on 
carrying out the physical tasks, you know, and, and, and everything to, to sort of get to the point of um of just doing it, you know, it was it was as simple as just being able to do it without I guess much forethought around coaching and, and empathy and emotion. And you know, it's definitely sort of progressing and changing now. And yeah, I think for me, especially in, in the early moments of my career, that empathy and, and feeling connected and seen uh, definitely helped me to bring out, as I said, that true self and that that true performer that um, would listen to himself rather than uh, the periphery in our. Yeah, I mean, you went on, you, you enjoyed some wonderful years at the Rhinos. Um, and I imagine, uh, as as an outsider looking into what what it would what you know what's life like when you're in a professional, a sort of high high sort of elite level rugby team, you, what one imagines. I'm sure I'm not alone in imagining this. There's a lot of bravado. It's all big and tough. And but actually, behind you know off the pitch, did you feel there was a, a good level of psychological safety? within that team, that, that, that group of players, the, the, the management structure, you know, if you're struggling with your mental health, you weren't coping, did you feel that it was something that you could easily be open about or would it have been something you'd have squashed and sort of kept under wraps because you wouldn't have wanted anyone else to know? Yeah, that's a good question. Definitely waves of safety and unsafety, I imagine, just like in any organisation and um, workplace and team, um, and, you know, growing up, I sort of realised that it was, it, it was the the release came on the field where you could wear your heart on your sleeve, you know, and you could give everything and, and that was sort of accepted. But off the field, it was a lot riskier, you know, in terms of emotional exposure and you sort of end up closing off and... Um, thinking that this this isn't the place for that and maybe this won't work and I've got to be like that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna close and conform and, and shape myself into into this. And then as I got older I realized that the whole person is is what you want. Um the whole person is who you want to speak with, who you want to be coached by, who you want to have in your team. Um, and it got to a point when I was young, 22 years old, where I'd probably squashed, like you say, a lot of that stuff down and felt depressed. And I know Gabor Mate talks about depression is, is pushing something down and, um, you know, not feeling what isn't safe to feel. And there were probably loads of stuff that I didn't feel safe to feel um, growing up. And I just realised I couldn't not feel it anymore. Um, I couldn't keep pushing it down and I launched Mentality um, as you mentioned in the intro that was 2016 and it was an online magazine made to talk about mental health to talk about emotions as if they were these alien thing and uh, in an environment which was completely sort of a miss of it and I uh, feedback and the sort of connection and the empathy that I got was was just unbelievable and I wasn't even playing at the time. And uh, I just thought, is this like, is this world that we, we just we live that we don't speak about? And I'm like, well, well why not? I don't, I don't understand it. Like, and it's all for fear and, and, and judgment and, and shame. And uh, yeah, I think it's been sort of a, something that I've not really been able to uh, um, let lie since I've done it really. Yeah, I mean, I wonder how much we have like almost this assumption or stereotype. I was thinking back to a conversation I was having in the pub a few weeks ago after game of football, I still play. And me and this chap, we were chatting sort of politics and the state of the economy, something like that. And and a guy yeah. came up, the, the part of the football team was like, oh, this is very deep talk, isn't it? Like a real sort of like deep talk, feelings talk. Oh, I don't know about I know. That. And it's well, like, yeah, it, but... <laughs> It's strange. I don't yeah. get it. I'm like, yeah. what? What do you mean deep? Like, do you mean real? Do you mean just yeah. like life? What? What? Do, what? Are we, what are we meant to go around speaking about? 
you know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah. But do you know what, you... Yeah, what encouraged me was it really struck me that I've not heard anyone say that for a long time. I do remember that. I used to be a recruitment consultant for my sins. And I do remember mm. though, that kind of almost like uh, feelings talk is kind of fluffy, happy, clappy, none of that nonsense here. But I do think it's changed. And that, mm. that comment was surprising to me because I've not heard anyone say that in, in my mm. circles for for a long time. So I hope it mm. is opening up. I mean, talk me through as well. Obviously, you, you were, uh, you know, some fantastic memories of playing at the highest level, most successful team. But but then there was sort of a life-changing injury. Was it uh, a one-off match where there was an injury and, and, and life was never the same again? Or were there a series of injuries over a period of time that made the initial ones sort of worse and worse? They were, uh, yeah, it, 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 I had obviously loads of amazing experiences um, and just the experiences made from when I was young uh, that were like reality defining, reality shaking, you know, from being 18 and walking out at both Wembley and Old Trafford in the first wow. year, you know, like to 80,000 people and he's still sort of dreaming about doing that, but I was living it and yeah, like walking into a different reality almost. And, uh, you know, I had a lot of success and, and won quite a few trophies and shared quite an amazing amount of relationships. Um, and yeah, 26, um, after sort of being a leader in, in different shapes and forms and, and do it un unofficially when I was 24, um, I'd been officially made captain in uh, what was 26 in 2020, and I just got two concussions um, at the start of 2020, and um, couldn't recover from after the the second one, and um, obviously post concussion syndrome it was called back then, and and when it goes over six months it's persistent um, concussion symptoms, which is what I I struggle with now. So I have headaches and, and dizziness and stuff um, being the main the main uh, hurdle that I live with in life. And, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult, mate, because we just spoke about me being a winner and an achiever and all the rest of it. And there's a part of me that's like, why am I not better? Why can I not get better? You know, what, what, what is it that, that, that's standing in my way? And, um, you know, like, it's an ultimate lesson really just like a lot of the injuries were to say that yeah you set a plan you set a goal and a direction for your life but ultimately um there's a, a much bigger um current to your life which um you have to accept you know um so yeah the the, the injury has been very very difficult and how did that affect you, you know, playing at, at the top level? I, I imagine from what you're saying in terms of your age, with with years to go yet, how, how did that affect you in terms of how you view yourself, how you viewed your world? I, I look back now, and uh, I mean, it's nearly four years. It'll be in February since since that second game. Um and I'm a diff I look like a different person, you know. Um, I'm, you know, I've got muscles coming out of my neck, and um, I'm, I'm probably ten kilograms, twelve kilograms heavier, you know, physically um, back then. And just the sheer amount of challenge, and and well, I'd say the challenge is pretty the same, but I guess the physical um, and mental strain that I was putting myself under in terms of the training and stuff was just so different to now where I struggle to exercise much now. Um, and I'm, I'm having to live a different life, mate. I'm having to live someone who cannot just train through something, someone who cannot just throw himself into um, a tackle and, and be celebrated and someone who can't um, just rely on his talent. And I'm having to rely on acceptance and, um, self kindness um and caring for you know the, the position I'm in really complete it's completely different and th there was an element and a shade of 
that life that I brought into my rugby playing career because I had so many injuries and I found it very, very difficult and felt a lot of shame at times and felt a lot of uh, pressure. Um, but now, you know, it's, 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 it's uh, yeah, a different playing field. Yeah. And what do you think helping you? I mean, obviously, since those injuries and you're doing a, a lot of really cool stuff, the, the coaching, the counselling, you mentioned the, the online magazine, the podcast. Mm -hmm. Is that helping you to, to rediscover a, a new purpose? Uh, is there something else that you're doing that you would say, look, I'm going to share this with the people listening because this has been really helpful to me in moving beyond this setback? Yeah, man. I mean... I got to a point last year where I was like, right, what, what am I doing? Because I've taken a, some time out, travelled to try and different treatments. Um, I've got around and met new people. And, you know, ultimately I had to find a new sort of, because I think I'm a, I'm a leader, you know, I've, I, I know I'm a leader and I know that I've got that drive in me and the, there has to be something um And I had to, I had to, I had to knock a few barriers out of the way really to speak so in depth about my experience and create what I felt intuitively, um, and step through some more fear and, and realize that actually, do you know what? I, I, I love speaking. I've, I've I've been a keynote speaker since I was twenty two. Funny enough, um, but realize that this is this is me. This is what what I want to do. And there's the pressure to perform. There's the creativity in there. There's the off the cuff stuff. There's the action, and and there's the reliance on me to to pull something out of the bag, which is is like playing rugby, and also um, taking something on and speaking about something. You know, in terms of you know the, the authenticity that I think is required um, to be a performer in 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 that level. Um, and speak about some of the know, the foundations and the building blocks of or the reality that sits upon all of the nonsense that I see people talking about high performance and stuff out there. You know, like it's just like we're not we're not for, for your mate in the pub um, for his shout out. We're not going deep enough at all. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it, yeah. I think I absolutely agree. And I'm just shifting it slightly. Uh, when it comes to men and boys, particularly, uh, I mean, I have uh, men from all walks of life on this podcast, sort of talking about their views on sort of masculinity. Uh, are men and boys struggling? If so, why? Um, I've not had many sports stars so far on this mm. podcast. Uh, I did have Darren Harris. He's the England uh, blind. Uh, captain of the England blind football team. Uh, he was on. So um, your view of uh, men and boys, are men and boys struggling in your opinion? Uh, is there a, a crisis with men and boys today? And if so, why? I don't know. I've only been around for 20. What are now? I'm 30 now. 30 years. <laughs> so um, I don't know, mate, compared to uh, history, how much are we actually struggling? I, I'm not sure. I mean, I read George Orwell's book on um, Wigan Pier and he's talking about the men that used to go work down in the mines. Um, that looks pretty difficult. Yeah. Um, you know, I was just thinking the other day about imagining World War Three and the call to go to war um, without any choice and have to go on the front line and, and fight. Um, and then, you know, you said I were a sports star and it, you know, we love to play the game um, and say that being a sports star is, is difficult and I'm not sure how difficult it is compared to what I just mentioned. Um, yeah. But the, uh, yeah, the, the struggle, mate, I think there's always going to be struggle. I think there's a, a struggle for us to... to to come to who we are really generally you know i think i think that's what there is i think there's an element of always coming up in a social framework and having to find that out and there's going to be the friction and, and anxiety around that and and um you know also 
yeah, I, I look at anxiety as, as something which is a message and a messenger and it's there's wisdom in it and there's there's a, a real um flag of anxiety to to go a bit deeper and and to um to find peace and content you know um instead of it being a nuisance it's actually something that i think will, will that can if you listen to it and feel into it and just um understand maybe the the emotions that that you're not integrating it's it, it it's a big help but yeah generally mate um probably are struggling but I, i'm not sure if there's there's ever been a time where we are haven't where we are no i think and i think that's an important insight uh i used to think you know and it was from from my perspective during covid lockdown i've got a house with a garden i don't know what it's like to live at the top of a tower block without a garden but for me with a garden the call to stay at home and be locked down at home uh, is a little easier to stomach than the call to go to the trenches in World War One. And I used to reassure mm. myself that however tough this is right now in my house, stuck with my kids, trying to homeschool them, actually mm. it could be an awful, awful lot worse and was. Yeah. Um, but I think really it's some of the data that shows. Uh, so politically, we know that uh, uh, women in their 20s are moving to the left of the spectrum, men to the right. There's been a whole uh, load of research that's come out to show that's quite stark. And, and, and the percentages are it's not a gradual shift here. We, we know that the number of women graduating is 57 percent now. And in education, boys are lacking across the board, lagging behind. Uh, and down, right down to uh, I was surprised by this as a stat in their th early 30s. Only 5% of women still live with their parents, but 15% of boys are still living with their parents. And we know, of course, that the, there's a tragedy around the, the people dying by suicide is three quarters are men. I just wonder whether in your life, uh, both within uh, as an elite rugby player and then coming out of that in this new life you have now as a speaker, whether you've picked up any of that. And if so, um what you feel is driving that um and do you feel that there is like a bit sort of gender division do you, do you see that in your role or have you seen that no it's, it's a good question i'd say that immediately i i, I wouldn't notice it but I, I know in the education side of it i think um as someone probably who just wanted to be out on, on, on the field and running around and moving around as a young kid. You know, I think that the education side is is probably for men um a bit harder to attain in um than women. Yeah. Um I'm, that's that's just in an amateur guess with what I've understood. Um yeah. But yeah, I'm I'm not sure, to be honest. I'm I'm not sure and I, I won't be able to give such an amazing answer to that. Well, I think in a way, you, you've and just to sort of come back on the answer that, that you have given. See, I, I'm not an elite sports person. I might have dreamt of being an elite football player, but I was never quite good. But I enjoy yeah. playing. What, what I lack in skill, I make up for in the desire to be good, at least. Um, but yeah. I, I, even as someone, you know, music was 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 my thing uh, in a musical family. Um, but I really struggled being in that classroom day after day after day. I always wanted to be outside. Um, mm -hmm. And we know, of course, that, that teenage boys uh, have 30 times more testosterone in their system at that point in our lives than, than equivalent age girls. So I do think there is something within the education system that is not set up to really support boys and get the very best out of boys. And mm -hmm. I think, I personally think that therefore... Uh, a lot of boys are lagging behind, feeling like they're lagging behind, um, and and I do think that's part part of the issue. But but obviously not not all of it. Um, I mean, in terms of helping men and boys, and if you could give a message of encouragement to the men and boys listening to this podcast, um, you, you've been through a huge amount. Uh, you've it's relatively recent um, from what you're saying, but you, you you are coming to terms with the fact that your life has changed. You're, you're moving into a new season. A message of support for the men and boys. What how, what would you how would you best encourage them? Uh, yeah, I'd say that you know underneath all of it, you know whether whatever the flavor of suffering is, whatever the the anxiety is or the depression. Um, I do feel that they're signals. I, I, I feel like they're 
signals from our innate well-being that we have to sort of guide us back to a place that's more whole, that's 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 more in tune with feeling, and that's that's more, um, for want of a better word, our, ourselves. Um, that's what that's what I believe um, from from my experience, and it's something that when I listened to it and came back to it, it came across on the field, and it's it's it, you know it's where I could wear my heart on the sleeve, um, and. I try to do that every day. I try to do that every day. Um, whether that's just getting out in nature and meditating and feeling the sensations in my body, feeling those waves of anxiety that eventually can put me up into my head and my head and my thoughts are trying to work some things out and um, second guess and, and, and manipulate situations and, and be fearful. Um, I try to just get into my body um and I'd say that that's a big thing. You know, it's like it's like that defensive line I spoke to earlier. You know, coming up to that defensive line, there's there's the emotional exposure, there's the risk, and there's definitely the uncertainty um, within coming up to that defensive line. And I see that as coming up to how we're feeling um, every day uh, with what what can be pre presented to us. And if we have the luxury of being able to sit with it for ten minutes a day um, and meditate on it and um, give attention to it, then it's quite revolutionary, actually. Yeah, so, I mean, that's wonderful. It's a wonderful way to end the podcast. You're, you're talking around, there's in terms of coping with adversity, you've talked around being outside, being really present with your thoughts, sort of returning mm -hmm. to one's whole self. I mean, these this is all wonderful stuff and stuff to definitely consider um, when you are struggling. So I really appreciate you sharing your insights. Uh, Stevie, how can people most easily find you if they want to connect with you after this podcast? Um, I think you find me on Instagram uh, on a username that I made when I was 16. That's S-T-E underscore Ward. Um, uh, LinkedIn, Stevie Ward on there. Ooh. And also stevieward.co.uk on the old Google website malarkey you can find me on there perfect stevie wood.co.uk stevie it's been an absolute pleasure having you here on men and show thank, thank you, you so much for giving up your time to be a guest thank you andy